Um, first, we would like to thank you all for coming in to join us uh, for our Teen Culinary Apprenticeship. Very first virtual field trip um, due to COVID-19. We are all shut down and we are doing the best that we can virtually. And we will continue to do so until we are able to see each other in person. Just to start off with our introduction, I would like to ask you all to tell us your name, your job title, and what your favorite food to cook or to eat is. I guess I can start off as the moderator. Uh, my name is Doris Dyer. I am a community chef instructor and also the city programs manager for the Sylvia Center. Things that I like to cook, my family, is, they are from the South, Mississippi, so I like everything Southern. <laughs> Things that I like to eat, um, Thai food, lots of greens, lots of pasta, and definitely some seafood. <laughs> Hey, what's up, y'all? My name is Jesse Sparks. I'm an editorial assistant for Bon Appetit, and um, I also love Southern food. If anybody's ever making gumbo, I'm ready. Always have a bowl, so uh, feel free to share. I'm Laura. I'm the staff photographer, and I really like to eat tacos, and I like to <laughs> eat chocolate chip cookies. I'm not the best at it. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm Andy Barigani, senior food editor at Bon Appetit. Um, foods that I love. Um, I'm really not a picky eater. I, I love kind of a lot of salty foods, anything with any kind of salty ingredients from anchovies, uh, miso, soy, fish sauce. Like I crave those foods uh, every single day. Um, I love vegetables, um, raw, cooked, really any shape or form, pickled. Uh, and plenty of seafood. Those are the foods that I tend to want to eat and cook a lot. I'm Rachel. I am the Associate Director of Social Media at Bon Appetit. And I recently made focaccia for the first time. Um, and it was a very um, pleasurable experience from the waiting for it and then getting to like dimple it and then the like final fluffy, amazing outcome. Um, it's a very like fun baking project uh, that I enjoyed a lot. Krista, um, I'm the art director at the magazine online and um, my favorite thing to eat and cook is anything egg related, mostly because it's one of the few things I can cook, but also they're just a fascinating thing to eat. Hi everyone, my name is Priya Krishna. I'm a contributing writer at Bon Appetit and I have been making a ton of dal and fried rice because they're both very easy and fast to make. I'm Julia Kramer, I'm the deputy editor. Um, I mostly now cook for my two kids, one of whom is three years old, so his favorite foods are um, plain pasta, no butter, no olive oil, um, cheese <laughs> sticks, unheated um tortillas it is like really bottom of the barrel over here <laughs> i have a 14 year old and his thing is ramen so we try to make as much homemade ramen as possible <laughs> so i understand <laughs> the 14 and the two-year-old they're, they're kind of like close in age <laughs> Thank you guys so much for those introductions. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about the Teen Culinary Apprenticeship. Um, during the year, we start to recruit our teens in October for a February through June model of an apprenticeship. They would come to our locations throughout the, the five boroughs and we would give them training on building curriculums, lesson planning, uh, culinary arts, nutrition, and they would go into the summer with a paid internship through SYEP. Unfortunately, with everything that's going on, SYEP has been canceled, but we have been able to acquire some type of paid internship for them um, that they will be doing virtually and there's going to be a great added value project. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, they spend about 60 hours with us in the classroom, hands-on doing work, and then various uh, volunteer events. They might take place in community events as well. 
Now, with the Sylvia Center, we also have other programming. Uh, one is called uh, Cooks for Health Youth and Cooks for Health Teen. It's a mirror of TCA. However, it's just um, more focused on the fun component of it, not so much the work aspect of it because we are getting them ready for the workforce. It's a great program. I've been with the Sylvia Center for over a year and a half, and it's it was terrifying to be able to teach teens. However, they have taught me so much and they are great learners and they also have this very interesting background where they've already been involved in agriculture and farming and gardening. So it's, it's pretty cool to you know see them develop into the young people that they are. Some of our students who are actually online with us now are alumni. And those alumni, some of them have come into the Sylvia Center and have been hired as chef assistants. So they have the opportunity to grow within the program. And we also have the ability to give scholarships. Um, so once a year, we all get together, we give those scholarships and we have our biggest benefit dinner. So TCA is still growing. We are trying to get something started up on Staten Island soon. Um, hopefully that's uh, what we will be doing for next year. And, um, you know, we hope to be able to be in the same space once again, sooner than later, but safely. Um, so uh, without further ado, if you guys are ready, I would like to start throwing out some questions your way. <laughs> So welcome TCA students, alumni, and staff. This is our first career panel. This is the Bon Appetit Day of Doing. Our very first question that will go to the you Bon Appetiters are, how did you get your start? I started off as a cook, you know, if, uh... I've written about this, I've spoken about this. Uh, it's almost as if cooking and food chose me very early on. I come from a background where I'm first generation American. My parents are uh, from Iran and they kind of brought those traditions and uh, that cooking with them when they came to the US. So uh, I ended up falling for that pretty early on. There's photos out there in the world of me as like a four year old, three year old with a Fisher Price kitchen and uh, this kind of obsession and passion eventually turned into a career where uh, I started learning how to cook from my family and then eventually in restaurants, uh, really apprenticeships working for free. Uh, now I feel like that's uh, not as available as it uh, once was, but uh, I just kind of found places and people that uh, I really admired. And that's the kind of thing that I always try to tell people is try to find uh, find someone or a place that's doing what you want to do in a, a, and doing a really good job at that. So for me, that was a restaurant called uh, Chez Panisse uh, back in California, where I'm from in Berkeley. And uh, I knew it was a special place. And so I went there, uh, sort of as an intern, eventually worked my way up as a, a prep cook, then line cook. Uh, left there, came to New York, uh, went to NYU, uh, skipped culinary school, never went to culinary school. Um, and then while I was at NYU, I started working in restaurants kind of part time and then eventually kind of made the switch into um, the food media world. Uh, first at Sever, uh, where I was an intern there in the test kitchen, as well as an editorial intern. And then uh, eventually, went back into restaurants, kind of been going back and forth between restaurants and media, and then uh, ended up at Tasting Table, a small startup where uh, I was a food editor and for about two years before being uh, really brought on by BA, where I've been uh, for the last four and a half years. So it's a mix of restaurants uh, as well as um, food magazines uh, with a few other kind of uh, experimental food uh, projects uh, along, but um, it was not a linear uh, uh, career, but I think that's usually what makes it kind of really interesting and exciting for me these last uh, 14, 15 years that I've been in the industry. Are you still implementing your family's traditions in your life today? Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the, the short answer is, is yes. I do incorporate the, those kind of flavors and certain techniques into the recipes that I develop. Not all my recipes uh, are necessarily inspired by my, my upbringing. I think for me, it's really important to kind of uh, carve out my own um, uh, cooking style and, and not be constrained or confined by uh, the traditions of uh, Iranian cooking. So uh, if anything, I, I've been very kind of careful with the way I kind of go about of uh, integrating those those flavors, but it's very important to me to kind of push those flavors, push those ingredients, uh, and definitely those dishes because um, I think growing up, I took it for granted being exposed to that. And I think now I have the, uh, I'm in a space where I could actually really share those to so many of our readers and viewers. Uh, and it's been definitely an important thing for me. Well, now let's go to Rachel. Rachel is the Senior Media Director for Bon Appetit. How did you get your start? Especially now that uh, media and, and social media is a, such a driving force in the world right now. So I think um, I grew up loving cooking, loving food. Um, and it was in college that I sort of made um, a blog about, it was like a food blog. Um, and I wrote about restaurants I liked and recipes I liked to cook. And I think now I'm like totally embarrassed if anyone ever saw that blog, but um, that was kind of where I was able to put together you know, a self-made portfolio of some of my food writing and is something that for my first job, which was at a meal kit delivery startup um, called Plated, um, that was like the one thing that I had to sort of show my interest in the food world and that I was able to write about it. And even though I hadn't, you know, written for a magazine or written, um, really anywhere like in college besides you know for some classes like it was a portfolio that i had full creative control over so for me writing about food early on creating this blog was like really important for me in terms of getting that first internship and it really was that first internship that then allowed me to um sort of find my way within social media and food and at that first internship i actually like they didn't want to hire a social media person. They didn't see the value in it. So I was doing HR for them, which is what I sort of studied in college. Um, so I had to do HR, um, customer service, and social media for them for like the first probably year that I was working there just to prove that they should have a full-time social media person. Um, so I had to wear a lot of hats early on. Um, and it, eventually I was able to do that. And then um, I worked there for about three years and then um, – went over to BA um, to be uh, their first like official social media person. Um, and I've been there for about um, three and a half years now. Thank you for sharing that because you went from being in a position where your role wasn't actually printed. It's like they didn't know anything about how to go about giving you a position with that title and you made it your own and you basically said, well, this is what I do and created your own job profile. So that's pretty awesome. Okay. And now let's move on to Krista. Krista is the art director for Bon Appetit. Hi, Krista. Hi. Um, my sort of journey was a little bit more traditional and a little bit more boring, you know, went to art school and majored in graphic design. And then while I was there, um, sort of figured out that what I wanted to focus on was magazine design. So did a couple internships during my summers um, at like Esquire magazine and all these other varieties of magazines that sort of didn't pertain to my interests. Um, and then like started to meet a lot of like the very um, small community of like magazine designers. Um, and then got my first job at Esquire eventually um, and learned a lot there. And then after that, it sort of just becomes like a musical chairs of professional, like just jumping from magazine to magazine with like all your new friends. So after that, I went to a couple other brands and then Connie Nast Traveler, where then I met my creative director currently, uh, Michelle Outland. And then she became the creative director at Bon App and then invited me over and here I am. <laughs> well, yeah. 
Thank <laughs> Thanks. you so much, Crystal. And right. Jesse, how are you, Jesse? Hey, I'm good. How are y'all doing? Good, good, good. Um, so yeah, so mine is kind of similar to Krista's. So I actually started out doing high school newspaper. Um, I was one of those kind of like earnest kids. It was, yeah, you know, <laughs> that's me. That's my brand. Um, but then it was kind of something that I was like, you know what, I actually really like this. I'm just going to be as curious about it as I can be. Um, so I started doing internships in high school and then went off to journalism school and was just like, I actually really love this. So I just worked at a lot of different places, however I could. Um, like I was going to classes during the day, going to work afterwards and like immediately running out to do like print design internships to kind of figure out um, where I kind of saw myself fitting into the media landscape. And then I actually had a friend, Eliza Barbanel, who's the assistant editor at Healthy-ish. Uh, we went to school together. She followed up with me and was just like, hey, I remember taking that class with you. There's a job here. Do you want to like talk about it? See if you might be interested. And I kind of fell in love with it. And yeah, the rest is history. See, this is a great example of the power of networking. You never know who you're sitting next to in a classroom and you never know where that can take you in the future. Thank you for sharing that, Jesse. Uh, Laura, who is the staff photographer, which is so very important, especially today, um, because this is all we see on social media. And I try to make people understand as much as possible that when they think of culinary arts, when they think of food, it's not just being in the kitchen, but photography is a huge part of it you guys make our food look so good um so yeah you know, like ever since i was younger i was really into photography and then i went to um the fashion institute of technology to study it um after getting my associates i had like two years where i was working retail and i was touring with like some friends bands taking photos because i originally wanted to be in music um and then I kind of realized, like, okay, like, not for me anymore. I want to figure out what's next. Went back to school, finished, um, interned at a bunch of places, and kind of realized that something that I loved about music was the community. And I kind of found that, again, in the food world. And I also grew up, like, as soon as I got my working papers, I was working in restaurants. And I loved it. So I kind of just gravitated back to that world. I got hired at BA as um, the photo department assistant right after school. Um, after doing that for like a year, I went and freelance so I could just learn more about photography. And I would still come into BA once in a while. Um, I assisted the old photographer, Alex Lau too. And then eventually I signed back on this past October. And it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you all for our first question. Our next series of questions, anyone who would like to jump in, feel free. Okay, so our next question is, what do you love about working at Bon Appetit? I love just working with such talented people because it really does at least inspire me to push myself. You know, I realize that these food editors, when they make these recipes, it's like they're babies and I want to make sure I can do it justice. And same with, you know, the graphic team. Like, I know I want to make the photos for them to work with. So it's just, it's really, I feel like I'm really lucky to work with such inspiring people. As someone who like just admired Bon Appetit for so long, it is it was like already this like really strong visual brand that was sort of catapulting food with like these really playful um, sort of visuals, especially like being so modern and like sort of felt like that like BA as a brand's always been like pushing that. And it's so exciting to like collaborate with all the amazing people in the kitchen and then like also our like incredibly smart edit team and it just feels so fun to like constantly be energized by that it's amazing and food is awesome like who like food? <laughs> yes the people that we work with were so lucky from the art and photo department food editorial video like every department really contributes uh to the brand i think what's been really exciting for me is to see when i came on 
uh, we had the magazine and we had the website, bonappetit.com. But from there, we've grown to uh, have two other verticals, basically.com, healthy-ish. Um, our, I don't even know how many subscribers we had on our um, YouTube channel before. Like, it had to have been probably, Julia, you might know this better than me, but like, probably like a very, very sad number, probably less than 100,000. And now I think we're like around... I, oh, I don't, Rachel, do you have any idea? Like over five three million, million, five, million. Five, five million. So to have grown that much over uh, the last uh, three, four years, and to see like how many people uh, tune in to, to our podcasts every week, uh, and then our newsletters, like we've grown and evolved beyond just the magazine, and it's really amazing to see how everybody has kind of rise to the occasion to contribute. Do you guys feel like over the past few months um, with COVID-19 uh, being in the world and taking over that your online presence has grown or do you feel like there is, you know, less of a presence there? I mean, just from a social perspective, I would say like we've had to be really thoughtful about, you know, what we're putting out there right now. You know, how do we use our platform for good right now we're constantly thinking about how we have this reach like people need help what can we do on our social platforms to do that i think any brand that has a big social platform has a responsibility right now to be using it for that um and then just in terms of like you know people's lifestyle changes right now we're putting out recipes that are more affordable that you can make with pantry ingredients and we are trying i don't i think that we would maybe would have seen a natural lift regardless but we're really trying to meet the the reader, you know, follower where they are right now and trying to understand what they want to see. And we, you know, kind of implemented that as soon as we felt it ourselves. And we always are thinking about what, what do we want to read right now? What do we want to see right now? Um, so this question can go out to anyone. A few of you have already answered it, but if there was another career path you could have taken, what would it have been and why? Uh, well, this one's funny, um, just because I actually did kind of have a different career path before I pivoted back into like writing. So for a while, I had been actually page designing at the New York Times. So I would have kept on doing print design there. Uh, I feel like that was like my second life on the other hand. Uh, Andy, you used to be a chef. Do you miss it? Well, I, I mean, I still very much am cooking so much of the time developing recipes for BA and uh, granted, uh, you know, we're not in uh, one real trade in the test kitchen and uh, cooking with with my friends and coworkers. I'm still cooking at home and uh, those recipes end up going on the website and the magazine. But um, it's, it's definitely not the same kind of uh, having the other food editors with me. I think like a huge thing that I depend on when I develop uh, a recipe is having that kind of dialogue and that conversation, uh, not just with the food editors, with anybody at BA who is on the story with me and having that kind of pushback and seeing how, it, you know, it can't just be a recipe that tastes good or that looks good. It needs to fit the story. It needs to uh, go along with the story. It needs to uh, make sense. It needs to kind of help, you know, it, I think like a great story, nothing, um, overshines like the writing is just as good as the photos and the recipes are right there along with it like you want everybody to be at, at its best what are the challenges you face during excuse me what are the challenges you face using the online platform or what challenges do you face in the new virtual style world um, i know a lot of people including ourselves we've had to take a in-person class and make it virtual and we are still dealing with some of the hiccups and we are also facing things like being able to access food to make these recipes um, just so that our students are able to see the demonstrations of the foods that they would have been making in class. Uh, I have, I know some people at BA who it seems like they're just have taken off, they're striving during this time, like they're just really uh, able to just do so much um, and still keep their spirits high. 
Uh, I'm someone who I think I'm, I, I, I'm a New Yorker. I love the city. I'm addicted to that energy. You'll never see me stay home for more than like a night or two during the week. Uh, that just how I am and how I'm wired. And I think so much of my inspiration and what inspires me and the stories that I pitch, the restaurants I pitch, chef, recipe ideas, food ideas, uh, travel ideas is for me kind of existing out and about and and living and, and connecting with others. And um, unfortunately, like I don't really just sit and get inspired or just think of an idea just by sitting down or going on Instagram mm -hmm. and not to diminish that. I think there's still like, if you're able to do that, that's a whole other skill. But I think for me, it is, it, it's quite a struggle to be inspired and to come up with ideas at a time where I, uh, you know, I, I do feel, uh, I, I'm sure all of us, you know, feel confined and constrained. Totally agree with you, Andy. And like, I just miss being in a studio with people so badly. <laughs> oh, I, we're still like shooting some stories here. And like you said, I, I'm having a hard time finding ingredients. And then I'm trying to cook things, which has been an adventure by itself. <laughs> being on set with like an editor, a creative director, a prof stylist. It's so collaborative that this is so different now. <laughs> um, Rachel, uh, as a food blogger, as a blogger, period, do you think that you've been able to produce more material now rather than when, you know, everything was open and you were able to move about? I think like um, on the social team, it's me and my colleague, Emily Schultz, and we're always asking our editors um, to send us photos of what they're cooking so that we can populate the um, Instagram feed with, you know, what our editors are making right now. And it has been very helpful in that sense because um, everyone is cooking so much. So I do feel like we're getting more content in that way. Um, but another kind of pillar of our social strategy was always regramming people who were eating out at restaurants and giving sort of restaurant recommendations. I um, mean, that sort of has totally disappeared from our feed. Um, so, and I think it's important um, to still, you know, support restaurants right now. So we've had to come up with new ways, like we created this new series called Chefs at Home, where we're finding ways to have chefs record what they're making at home right now, which has been really successful. And at the end of those, they can always shout out, you know, that they're still doing delivery or what GoFundMe people can donate to. So we've sort of had to find ways to pivot our strategy to like, A, have enough content and B, still support the restaurants that usually would have gotten love in different ways on our feeds. Um, this question is going to go directly to Laura. What are the excuse me? What are the tricks and tips to taking beautiful food photos? Oh, we just filmed a little something about this, right, Rachel? For Instagram, can I say that? Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> step one: lighting is key. Um, your lighting in the kitchen is usually not the best. Um, our windows are nature's softbox. So just bring it over to a window, get some nice soft lighting on there. Um, yeah, I mean, and also when, when it comes to propping, you can cheat anything to be a good surface. You can use like fabric, a sweatshirt, a towel even, you can kind of cheat that out. Um, Rachel, do you have any other tips for at home food photos? I think, yeah, just making it look lived in. It's, you know, it should look within the right sort of like scene. Um, but yeah, you hit the, I think natural light is like the most important one in my opinion. Um, I think we can all benefit from it because everyone is taking more and more photos of their food. Even when they were going out to restaurants before you can touch the food, it was, wait, I have to take a picture first. <laughs> so I totally understand that. Um, our next question is, who do you follow on social media and why? This is one of the questions that I have uh, asked to be included in this forum uh, for the reason of when I was in culinary school, I was a mommy and the last thing I was thinking about was who to follow. But it was one of the questions that I had 10 years ago and I still have it now. So who would you suggest our students and our staff follow to keep up with uh, the things that are going on and, and how, you know, um, 
to get access to food or or just for fun recipes or anything fun? Like, who are you guys following? Um, I think for me, I'm just following anyone that can inspire me or can inspire a new idea or like people that I would love to work with someday. Like, I think that I have really tried to make my digital spaces places where I can kind of get restored, get refreshed, see what other people are talking about and like listen in on those types of conversations. So like, for instance, there's an account called Black Food Folks, uh, which is a community of black people who are either working in restaurants, they're chefs, they're writers and media, they're podcasters, food bloggers, like the whole nine. Um, and they just have so many brilliant conversations, both about the state of the industry, what they're up to, what the industry can be doing better. Um, and that kind of makes me better in turn. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's my big thing. But my I do have like one big rule is like the second that someone I'm following starts to make me feel bad in a way that's not productive, that's not necessarily mm -hmm. challenging, challenging me to grow. That's when I have to completely like back out because we're not doing that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Krista, like who are you following on social media? I'm very sorry, it's gonna be a bit boring. I am a, <laughs> like for me, because we are so in the world of trying to like create these um design sort of responses to um make like the food photography look fun or like sort of share like a particular like let's say fourth of july sort of feel or whatnot um i follow a lot of type designers which are people who design like really cool fonts something that we could potentially use um follow a lot of um like illustrators because that's something especially now that we constantly have to have on deck to commission like a love story about kimchi and we need someone who can really like make a cute not just a jar of kimchi but like a wonderful whimsical illustration for that so there's a lot of a lot of uh people that i would try to commission and also be inspired by um a lot of that just trying to stay on trying to you know <laughs> things are weird right now so trying to follow everybody <laughs> Um, you go first. Okay. Well, I feel like that whole like blogger, social media influencer, like editor, like it's all sort of this like amorphous person these days. Um, I follow I follow Ashton Berry, who I feel like is always like talking about current events in important and good ways, and I feel like um, she keeps me like up to date, and I feel like. Um, I follow a lot of chefs. I love Lucas Sin has been doing amazing Instagram stories every single day. Um, yeah, I feel like I follow a lot of, I think like a bucket I follow is like food editors and chefs. And then also just like for me following a lot of like brands that I think are doing social and like creative in new ways. And I find that I like get a lot of inspiration for BA social, not necessarily from other food brands. Um, I get it from like, you know, a clothing brand that I think is doing social in a different way or something totally outside of the food world. And I think to get inspiration for the food world, like it's really important to look outside of it as well. So I follow a lot of non-food accounts to keep things sort of balanced. I'm pretty sure I follow everybody on BA. <laughs> um, so all the BA uh, editors. Um, and I think in regards to like who I follow on Instagram, you know, for me, it's important um, to follow people that inspire me in, a, in a many different ways, not just in regards to food and cooking. So um, obviously I follow a, a good amount of chefs, both in the US and outside restaurants uh, to see what they're doing, a range uh, uh, of type of restaurants and cuisines, uh, but also, you know, farmers, ceramicists, big fashion brands, small fashion brands, um, uh, creative, creative agencies. I mean, I do kind of follow a lot of different people uh, and probably more non-food people than food people, uh, just because, you know, I think especially when it comes to cooking sometimes like, and I think like a few people, a few people um, 
in this um, this group right now have been in meetings with me and have seen me where I'm like, I want to make this dish look like this, or you know, I get I try to be pretty visual and not with every recipe, uh, but sometimes it will be inspired by something that has nothing to do with food. Um, and that's, uh, uh, that's why it's good for me to kind of keep a range of Instagram accounts, um, to follow. Yeah. I've been following a lot of interior design for some reason. So that's been like, well, I, that's been not a new thing, but like, it just like to see the different shapes and textures and you could apply that to food very easily and the layering and the tension. Basically, that's where it is. You can become inspired by some of the things that you see that are not even food related. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, so this is going to be our last question before we move into Q&A with the questions that were submitted by our students or staff. Um, so I wanted to know, we want to know, um, what are you doing right now for self-care? It's a tough time and I know a lot of people are suppressing their emotions and how they're going to deal with grief. So me, for one, I am worried about um, the impact that it will have on people's lives when we are allowed to go back outside because all of that grief that was building up is gonna hit so how are you guys going about self-care and how are you staying healthy mentally and physically? Uh, one thing that has been so helpful for me is to just kind of have periodic check-ins with different friends from different parts of my life. So I have friends that every Friday we're doing like a virtual happy hour or we're checking in, or even if I don't have time to do like a whole like FaceTime, I'll just send like a little message that's just like, hey, thinking about you, hope you're doing okay. Um, but little things like that are ways that I can kind of feel more connected, check in on my community and take care of other people, which, you know, helps me a lot, uh, knowing that the people in my community are taken care of. I think first and foremost, kind of reminding myself, and I know I've spoken to a few people, um, at BA about this and and along with other people, just like these are um, uncertain times. Um, you're allowed to have good days. You're allowed to have bad days. I think like more than ever, this is a time to be gentle and to be kind and not be so critical uh, to yourself. Um, and I'm certainly not perfect at that. I definitely have days where I, I would cringe and get frustrated at myself, but I think really saying that out loud and reminding myself that is definitely a huge help. And uh, what I said earlier, there's some people who are seem to be striving during this time and they really are able to just like they their best domestic self. And, and, and there's others like myself where it's like, you know, it's takes a, it's a, some days are a little bit harder than, um, than others. And, and that's perfectly fine. Um, all I need to do is just put a few face masks on and I'll be ready to go. If my face looks okay, then, then I th I'll be, I'll be a little bit better. <laughs> I'm trying to only listen to the news every other day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, read the news only every other day, um, just to sort of give myself a mental break. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to stick to a routine, whether it's just like, using my house to like c help compartmentalize like my work from home office and then where I'm not working um, has been a little helpful, but it's, you know, just accepting that there's going to be good days and bad days. Like Andy said is really important. You just got to live, go through it. <laughs> I think what we can take from that is it's okay to not be okay. So thank you guys so much for that. Uh, this question is from Dominica. She wants to know, like, do you think that Bon Appetit will begin to develop more plant-based recipes in the near future, given how nutritious and environmentally friendly they are and why and why not? Uh, I think this has been a huge thing for all of us from the food team and the way we're approaching recipes. I mean, we have guidelines now that we implemented 
I'd say maybe about three, three, four or five months, somewhere around that, uh, of just a few different guidelines on how we're approaching recipe development. And one of them is how to kind of cut waste and do more plant-based recipes. Um, if you look at just like our vertical healthy-ish, but not even just healthy-ish, I think like basically, uh, and um, bonavity.com as, uh, as well as our print magazine, just the amount of uh, plant-based recipes we're developing now compared to even two years ago, four or five years ago, it just, it, it, we know that's definitely where people are moving towards. And that's also how a lot of our staff is eating. You know, majority mm -hmm. of the week, um, I, I don't eat meat. I, I haven't had any red meat this whole entire quarantine only because the person that I'm with doesn't eat red meat as well. So, um, but, but it's just, it, even if I was back in the city, I really, it's, it's such a small part of my diet. And I think people are becoming a lot more conscious and thoughtful of the way uh, they shop and consume food. So definitely that's uh, something that we're uh, applying to the way we develop recipes. Um, this question is actually gonna be for Laura. It's also from Dominica. I would like to know, any advice you would like to give to your past self because your career path did make a, a really big shift? Ooh, past advice, just hang on pretty much. And like, honestly, just like trust, I would tell myself to just trust myself because I mean, I definitely had times where, I mean, even when I was like working at the mall, like just so discouraged and just be getting so upset and I would just tell myself like, just relax, keep working and just keep like pursuing what you're really into. Cause like, it'll work out in the end. <laughs> so I feel like that's the advice I would give past Laura. <laughs> uh, this next question is coming from Sam Mole. We, he would like to know uh, when developing recipes, how is accessibility and cost of ingredients considered? And uh, do you try to have a blend of budget eats and more expensive dishes? This is something that I think like it's been uh, something, food editors, it's been more of um, in the back of our mind. And I think now we're realizing that it should be very much a high priority. Being in quarantine has really uh, seen from um, our our subscribers just what they want. And a lot of it is recipes that are, uh, doesn't involve too many ingredients, doesn't involve so many expensive ingredients that um, uh, isn't so costly. And I think we're very much kind of creating future guidelines and rubrics to kind of go about recipe development that way. Um, Rachel, um, you mentioned earlier that the shift with everything that's going on uh, with Bon Appetit online, you guys are trying to develop more recipes um, that are shelf stable and based off of pantry items. We too are trying to do the same things. And I wanted to know, like if you had to go to a grocery store today, which pantry items are you most mostly going to, to buy to purchase? I feel like I've been, I have like so much pasta in my pantry right now, um, mm -hmm. relying on that a lot. Um, a lot of, I eat like a can of chickpeas like maybe every day. Um, I love canned chickpeas. Um, obviously there was like a moment where like flour was harder to find. Um, and I feel like, yeah, I went to my bodega last week and they had a bunch of flour now. And I feel like it was like a lot of like online stores were out and it sort of created this like craziness and a lot of you know bodegas still were well stocked and there was also yeast at my bodega so I'd definitely get that if that was there um mm -hmm. yeah I feel like I've, I've been relying a lot on like um canned tomatoes so like getting pureed like crushed and um you can kind of build a, a sauce with that and mm -hmm. also spices I feel like I've been really 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 like grateful for having a stocked um sort of like spice pantry right now um, our last question will be basically kind of like a, a icebreaker, but this is a not so much icebreaker, but an ice builder. <laughs> 
what restaurants are you looking forward to visiting once the shutdown is lifted? Like, I can personally say I'm looking forward to a good bowl of ramen from um, Naruto. <laughs> Okay, one thing that's been coming up for me a lot during this quarantine is, weirdly enough, I don't really care for falafel, but the falafel platter at Chez Matan was so good, and I keep thinking about it, and maybe one day we'll be reunited. That's, <laughs> I would say that's my like number one. <laughs> for me, it's just dumplings from anywhere. There's no way I'm ever going to make those, so... And it's like a really good soup dumpling. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I, the first thing that came to mind was um, those tacos numero uno. Like I just would eat so many tacos right now and it was right near our office and it had just sort of opened recently and I miss going there and going with my coworkers and eating all the tacos. So thank you, Bon Appetit, for joining us today. Thank you to Sylvia Center staff for joining us, our alumni, and our students. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.